Richard Lewis from Natural England and I'm presenting today's uh, presentation on peatland restoration and the historic environment, building sexual skills in grant-aided restoration. So today I'm going to discuss management of the historic environment across the UK in introducing the guidance resources that are currently available. We'll explore some issues around um, how we protect peatland heritage while responding to um, the increasing threat of erosion uh, in our mires and bogs. Um, we'll talk about the special skills that we need in order to engage with this kind of work um, and how we're going to ensure that the advice that we offer and the decisions that we make as a sector are pragmatic and evidence-based. Um, so I'll just share my presentation with you. And there we are. As you can see, there are several agencies involved in this. Um, we are representing the UK Heritage Working Group Peatlands. So there's me in the corner, Kat Hopper Lewis. Um, also involved are Hannah Fluck and Zoe Hazel from Historic England, Fiona Grant and Ian Halfpenny from CADAO, Cara Wood from the Historic Environment Division in Northern England. Ireland and uh, Tom Gardner from Historic Environment Scotland. Um, obviously Ian doesn't look like that but that's what happens if you don't send people your presentation photographs and they make you into Tolland man. Uh, so uh, first off we're just going to have a quick look at why we do grant-aided restoration. Uh, peatlands are both a natural and a cultural landscape so they're created through the anaerobic decay of sphagnum moss um, and that waterlogging um, prevents aerobic decomposition. It locks in greenhouse gases and it creates um, a high organic material growth uh, medium that supports lots of biodiversity and uh, controls flooding and water quality. Um, but it also preserves iconic archaeological sites within it. Um, so the same acidic anaerobic conditions that um, contribute to a unique habitats of raised bog, blanket bog, fen and bog woodland also preserve organic materials within, um, under and above the peat. We estimate that there are around 22,000 archaeological sites in UK peatlands and um, that's based on the Van der Noort estimates from the early noughties. However, we think that's a massive underestimate, um, particularly for Wales. Um, and they're not just archaeological sites and archaeological finds that we have from peatlands, but also archaeological landscapes. So uh, the systematic drainage of UK lowland peat began in the 17th century and some of our landscapes um, result entirely from peat cutting or are essentially transformed by peat cutting for fuel. Um, so if we look at the condition of these landscapes, we've said that they're important and unique. Um, they're also in terrible condition at the moment. Over 80% of peatlands across the UK are classed as degraded. Um, a healthy peatland may grow one millimetre per annum. Uh, on cultivated peat, we're losing nearly two centimetres per annum. So we're getting a net loss of peat, and that includes the habitats that grow in it, the benefits that it provides, and the archaeology within it. Um, and particularly, this causes us problems for uh, carbon sequestration. Healthy peatlands are able to actually capture carbon. They are the temperate equivalent of a tropical rainforest. Um, but at the moment, UK peatlands are net emitters of carbon. They're in such poor con condition that they're actually letting their carbon go. Um, and for this reason, Peat and heritage is at really high risk as the uh, peat that it is within starts to degrade, but also it um, is threatened by peat and restoration. So you can see from the table here the massive targets that we have for restoration so far. I'll explain why Northern Ireland doesn't have a target shortly. Um, and here are the main drivers for uh, peatland restoration. You can see the heritage is on there, but in red, because that's not traditionally seen as a driver of restoration, but a constraint to it. Um, um, really, the Joint UK Working Party want to transform that vision and make it understandable that in order to preserve our heritage, that's another reason why we need to restore peatlands. 
So I'm going to have a quick gallop across the devolved nations because things are different in different areas. Uh, as you know, I'm from England. I'm working for Natural England. Uh, so any mistakes on this presentation are down to me. And hopefully if my colleagues are here in the chat, they'll be able to post a little uh, correction if there's anything that we've missed in our edits. Um, Scotland is one of the earliest adopters of peatland restoration. They've done a massive amount in the past years and they have the most amount of peat of all of the devolved nations at the moment their peatland plan is just up for review it doesn't currently contain any information about uh, cultural heritage but that is forthcoming um, and historic environments scotland are working on that with nature scotland and various other agencies you can see there's a massive amount of funding involved in this and also some complexities around turbary rights as well uh, the unique thing about Scotland is that in April 2021, they classified peatland restoration as permitted development. So that's actually covered by planning in Scotland. Uh, moving on to England, we have less peat than Scotland, but we have more lowland peat, which is has a higher likelihood of having substantial archaeological sites within it. And possibly for that reason, or possibly because I've been nagging about it for about 12 years, we, the England Peat Action Plan um, does contain some information about uh, cultural heritage. And if I can find my notes, I can tell you exactly what it says. Uh, so it asks us to protect the historic environment of peatlands so the important evidence of our past can be preserved for the future and ensure that restoration projects deliver cultural heritage, education and enjoyment alongside other public goods. So that's a really solid statement. Um, and most of um, the peatland restoration there is being undertaken with Natural England. Uh, we have got joint guidance with Historic England and have consulted with Algeo, um, and we're also working with large scale peatland partnerships. Uh, we've got less money than Scotland, but we're doing less area. Um, and we've only got a five year program and then we'll refresh. But what's key to note here is that most of our work falls outside planning or EIA. And so it's the grant scheme conditions themselves that provide the protection for historic features. In Wales, we've got much smaller amount of peat and some of their guidance. Uh, they're high level policies contained within other documents, um, but uh, the National Peatland Action Programme itself provides an overview of the plan for peat in Wales and also um, the delivery mechanisms. So um, they do have limited HE content, but there's a memorandum of understanding between Natural Resources Wales and the Welsh Archaeological Trusts to consult on undesignated sites and advice is provided by CADAW on designated sites. Northern Ireland has substantial peat. However, their Northern Ireland peat strategy is currently under consultation. So the consultation has closed, but we've not yet had the results of that. So at the moment, they don't have a live grant scheme. Um, only 1% of the Northern Irish peatlands have actually been restored. So the potential for future restoration here is absolutely vast. And again, it's a real priority. Moving on from that kind of overview to the specific restoration techniques themselves, uh, we've talked about why doing nothing is a bad idea. This is a quote from the Historic England's uh, brilliant historic environment and peatland document that came out in 2021. Um, and it really talks about why we can't just leave things. That degradation of the peat is just threatens our resource, our historic environment resources too much. So we're talking about restoration, but what does that actually mean on the ground? Peatland Action have got, I think, recorded over 50 different techniques. So here we've just got a, a small selection of what those might be. Um, and I've kind of classified them based on their impact via ground disturbance. Because if you're unfamiliar with these terms, that's hardly surprising. Wave dams was a new one on me this year. Um, other ones have kind of come and gone in their popularity. A lot of uh, historic environment professionals get very concerned about peat dams because they require the excavation of peat for borrow pits. And then that peat is redeposited within moorland grips or drainage channels. Um, 
myself, I get more concerned about kind of trench bunding, contour bunding, a fish scale bunding, which are really quite large scale interventions when it comes to excavation. On the other end of the scale, um, it's also possible to uh, block grips with coir or wool bunds, and they are simply laid onto the surface and pegged in with wooden pegs. So, you know, peat restoration doesn't have to be massively damaging, but it does have to respond to the site. Um, when working with the peat partnerships, um, they are the experts in this. So all we need to do is ask them what the technique actually constitutes and then translate that into its archaeological impact. So you might may not know what a fish scale bund is, but if someone shows you a picture of it and explains that it involves extensive ground disturbance, then you know that you don't want that to happen on a scheduled monument. You know, equally reseeding, it can look very harmless in terms of ground disturbance. Here I've got it down as low, but actually where do they get that seed from? Quite often um, it's heather brash that is cut from neighbouring healthier moors and that moorland cutting can itself create some damage. So it's really important to look at these things in the round, the kind of impacts that we might have include ground disturbance, obviously changes to the hydrology, absolutely. Also, we can have chemical changes from things like liming or the application of charcoal um, and compression, things like that as well. So how do we address this? This is a typical mitigation hierarchy. Everyone's seen this before. Um, we're really looking to avoid damage in the first place. Let's uh, consult, do a desk based assessment so we know what our known sites are put exclusion zones on, avoid those sites, maybe do pre-survey where we don't have sufficient information. Um, Geofencing, when we're talking about minimising impact, let's look at those techniques and see if we can shove someone towards the green end of the scale. Can we change where the borrow pits are situated? Can we uh, put them in a lower significance area? or perhaps change the technique so we don't need borrow pits at all. And finally, if we can't change those techniques, then we come to standard mitigation, talking about watching views, talking about excavation, but they do need to be proportionate. The one thing to consider when we're in this grantaded environment is that we don't have a polluter pays principle because it wasn't polluted. This has happened over so many years, some of the mall and gripping was actually encouraged by government for the um, greater productivity of the moorlands. Um, and so we don't apply that principle here. Instead, we're looking at, at getting efficient uh, payment for public goods. And so we need to be proportionate in the mitigation that we apply. So this is a bit of skills. We're here at CEDLA conference and we have the, a range of people that I want to talk to about this because I know that myself and all my colleagues have struggled with the skills and knowledge that people in the sector have. Someone said in the wither planning session earlier this week that 75% of archaeological work takes place within the planning system. Um, I know in this session we're specifically talking about things that maybe fall outside that with the exception of Scotland. So what do we need? We need um, physical skills, skills in survey, earth obs interpretation, skills at watching reef. We need data skills, we need scientific skills on how to monitor sites, how to analyse sites, and we need engagement and outreach skills, um, peatland, peat cores, and um, stories about heritage and how environments have changed over time are incredibly important when it comes to engaging communities, particularly those where they either fear change or uh, are climate change deniers, because we can explain to them how the site has already changed over time and that often helps them in embrace future change. So here are some things that people can do, really academics, you thinking about the knowledge gaps that we have? Um, how can you address that? What could you do? Um, contractors, if you can familiarise yourself with peat and restoration methodologies, you can provide such better advice. Um, you can upskill yourself either formally or informally. Curatorial advice, we really need that balanced advice that just as development control um, advice balances public good with the good of the archaeology, 
we need you to understand the ecosystem services provided by Healthy Pete so that you can appropriately balance that when giving archaeological advice. And all of you, if you are able to submit case studies about your peatland work um, to the Joint Heritage Working Group, that's amazing. You can send those to me at peatlandscheme at naturalengland.org.uk. That was a joint mailbox all about peat. So if you can put historic environment in the title, that's how it finds its way to me. So resources and training, there's so many things that you can do to upskill yourself on this. I have created uh, a resource handout which should be in the conferences resources page so don't panic when I start mentioning websites because you can actually download the handout for this but I've mentioned the national peatland plans if you need to know about policy it's all in those documents there that were on the individual devolved nation slides the written heritage sector guidance is mostly based in England but it has wide applicability and Historic England have hosted both their guidance and the joint guidance with Natural England so that's incredibly useful. Uh, the planning guidance for Scotland um, on historic environment and peatland restoration is hosted on the Algea website. Although that is Scottish relevant, it is really, if you understand the basic principles, I think is applicable much more widely. Um, the individual grant schemes themselves um, have a lot of useful data in them. And I'm going to big up my own scheme, Nature for Climate Peatland Grant scheme because it has an entire dedicated annex, Annex 5, on historic environment investigations for peat. And I've also been through the restoration annex that describes the type of techniques we will fund and flagged which ones are more HE friendly. So that's a really good resource to look at. Uh, peatland contractors um, such as Moors for Future and Yorkshire Peat Partnership all have outreach content, fact sheets, videos, all that kind of thing. If you want to do formal training on the historic environment side, get in touch with Historic England and think about apprenticeships. On the peatland side, Lantra do a two day contractors course that could be very valid. Um, there's also free online training available. Um, the link to the Peatland Action training is currently uh, defunct, but I'm hoping they're going to fix that. So I've included it in the resources anyway. There's also some IUCN Peatland um, online training, which is free and is really interesting to give you the basics on peat and peatland restoration. And then you can apply your own archaeological knowledge to that. It's a wide range of academic journals and publications. I've put a little um, link to some of the more um, pertinent ones onto that resources thing. And finally, when it comes to peer support, at the moment, it's very difficult for people working in the natural environment to communicate with each other. We had hoped to launch a CIFA Heritage and Natural Environment Special Interest Group at the conference, and we're not quite there yet. Um, but if you are interested in joining in on the development of that, um, again, on the resources uh, handout, it will tell you how to get in touch with us. So, um, oh, there we go. I've forgotten to press the uh, button on my slide, and that's going to put me 20 seconds over my 20 minute time scale. But up to the question session. So um, hopefully my co-presenters will be here in the chat as well um, and you can speak to me live on the question.